It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Larry DeLucas, previous astronaut and is on technical staff here at Aerospace. Please join me with your reactions in welcoming Larry. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So let's go ahead to the first slide. Come on. So I'm going to start by talking about how I got interested in science and how I eventually became an astronaut. So next slide. So when I was your age, you know what I wanted to be? A basketball player. I'm a little too short, huh? But anyway, that's what I wanted to do. I didn't think, you know, I could ever be a scientist. Um, I was on the basketball team in school, even in high school, and on the baseball team. Um, but I had some very good teachers, and I had a teacher in, in uh, actually beginning of high school that kind of told us a little bit about chemistry, and then later on, I took a chemistry course, and, and the teacher made it a lot of fun. What he would do is do an experiment, and the next day, we had that night, we had to figure out why the result happened that we saw, and we had to come in the next day, and he had a bunch of three-by-five cards, and each one had one of the students' names on it. And he would shuffle the deck like shuffling cards and he'd pull one out. And if it said Larry DeLucas, then I had to answer the question, what happened the previous day in the experiment? So it made it like a game. It was a lot of fun. And so I enjoyed chemistry that way. And I took end up two years of chemistry just, just in high school. So when I started college, I decided I, I don't know what I want to do, but I know I like chemistry. So I, I think I'll, I'll major in chemistry. And that's what I did in high school. Right, well, gosh. You, you see the photograph of the telescope over there. When I was in high school, I actually loved looking at the stars, never thought I'd be an astronaut, but we decided in the science club that we had, let's build our own telescope. We ground the mirror and you have to grind it so it's kind of curved in the shape of a parabola. It took us one year to do that. And then we polished it and we actually built the, the kind of tube it goes in and uh, we had our first telescope. That got me a little more interested in science and maybe astronomy, but I, again, never thought that I'd be a scientist, you know, for my career. And the next slide, oh, backwards, wrong slide, other way. So, so I ended up getting a degree in chemistry in college, and then I got another degree, a master's degree, um, and I didn't have any confidence that I could be a scientist back then, but it, it, for a master's degree, you have to do research, you have to do a project, and so I did a project on how your bone calcifies, and in, in, in a master's degree, when you do that research project, if you think you did a good job, you can present it and try to get an award, it's a competition called Sigma Psi. So I entered that and I ended up winning first place. And then I got even more confidence. And I think what also helped, I was doing really well on the tests that we take when we take classes. And this uh, one researcher asked me to come work for him. And so I made mistakes, you know, things didn't go well, but each time I made a mistake, he kind of tell me why and I learned. And then finally, I was suggesting to him how we could do experiments to get better results. So that gave me even more confidence. Maybe one day I could do this. And so finally, what I got interested in is doing the, the structure of molecules like you have in your body, proteins, even whole viruses today, we can determine where every little atom is. So I got involved in a technique called crystallography. I'll bet all of you know what crystals are. Well, you're going to see what I did for a big part of my career is grow crystals on Earth and eventually in space to get a better crystal so that we could determine the structure of these molecules. Next slide. You don't have problems happening anymore. Count yourself. So, so I ended up getting these degrees, and I finally was working on my doctorate degree, and here's where I got lucky. I kept playing basketball at UAB. I went to the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and I went to the gym one day, and I started playing a game, and I knocked over this older gentleman, and I knocked off his glasses, and I helped him up, and it turned out he was the dean at the School of Optometry, and I told him, you know, people in this field, it's so rare. You can't get a job after you get done, and I was thinking of dropping out of school, 
And he said, why don't you do two degrees? Get that PhD degree, the doctorate doing crystallography, but also become an eye doctor and work on both at the same time. So that's what I did. And it eventually that really helped me be selected for, for the astronaut position. Next slide. Next slide, yep. Yeah. So this is, so we grow crystals. I know you all know what crystals are. And what we do is we blast them with an X-ray beam and it bounces off and creates a pattern that allows us to see where every atom is in great big molecules. Now, why is that important? Well, if you said, how does a car work? You have to take it apart. Look at how it's built. The same is true of the molecules in your body in the COVID you know, vaccine that we developed, that's a molecule and the virus has lots of these big proteins in it. So once you know the structure of this, you can make a drug to go in and block it and fight different diseases. And that's what I ended up doing for a big part of my, my career. But there's a problem. It doesn't work well if you can't get a good crystal, a beautiful little crystal. And guess what? That's where space came in. Next slide. So... So here's one time when a, when a politician did something really good. Uh, we, had, we had a senator in Alabama. His name was Hal Heffern. He's passed away now. But he said, we got all these scientists at U University of Alabama at Birmingham, and we have all these scientists and engineers at Marshall Space Flight Center, just an hour and a half away, and they never get together. Let's have a conference and let them share what they're doing. So we did that, and a scientist at Marshall said we're growing crystals and you can see one here on the left screen and you see the white line coming up as the crystal grows the lighter molecules because of gravity float upward and when they hit the top of the solution then they come back down it's like stirring a pot and as a result as the crystal grows and molecules come in they may come in all different ways because what is a crystal it's like the row of bricks on the wall all if each brick was a molecule they all have to be perfectly aligned to make that beautiful crystal. But if they come in upside down and another one comes in too quickly, then before they can bounce around and get perfectly aligned, they get trapped in misalignments and you get a bad crystal. But when you go to space, there are no lighter and heavier molecules. So what happens? Now, what makes a molecule move in space? All molecules are vibrating. And they come in and bounce around. And if they come in upside down, now it's, it grows so much more slowly because there's no flow that they have time to get perfectly aligned and form that perfect crystal. So when I saw this, I said, oh boy, we, we got to do this with proteins. No one had ever tried it with proteins. And so we, we had to build something to do that. Next slide. Well, you're going to see. Watch your name. I learned space makes you think differently. Because without gravity, it's a whole different ballgame, what you have to do. And on the next slide, you'll see how I used to grow crystals here on Earth. This little well that you see down below is a big solution, like a milliliter. And the protein is in a little tiny drop above it. Now, the solutions can't touch. They have to just stay apart. And through the air, the drop gets smaller and forms a crystal. So that's the way we do it on Earth. But if I tried to do that in space, the liquid down below would hug the wall, come up and touch the drop. Because in space, the attraction of a liquid for a surface, it dominates everything. So how am I going to do it in space? Well, I built this device. Actually, I had an engineering group in, in Huntsville build it. And what I had is a syringe. And the syringes are up there at the top. And the astronaut turns a crank. And it makes a little bubble drop of the protein on the tip of the syringe. And the big solution down below is behind the metal that you see here. And how many of you use felt pens, these little felt pens? The material, that's it, almost everybody. The material in that pen is called chromex, and it sucks up liquid. So I thought in space, it'll hold the liquid so it doesn't touch the drop. And that's what happened. So now on the next slide, if you have an experiment on the space shuttle, you get to watch it right with the spouses of the astronauts, two miles away. And so in 1985, that was the first time my experiment, not me, but my experiment went to space. And you know, I've gone to many funerals and I just don't cry. I'm very sad, but I just don't cry. Well, I'm standing two miles away and I see the fire and smoke, but the sound hasn't reached me yet, right? 
because light travels much faster than sound. So I'm standing there watching this rocket take off. The space shuttle's taking off with my experiment. And all of a sudden, you get hit into your chest with a shock wave of the sound. The ground is actually vibrating that far, that close to the shuttle. Um, and I started crying. And I guess it was so powerful, it made tears come out of my eyes. I, I couldn't believe it. And I turned to my wife, and she was crying. There were television reporters there. They were crying. And then I turned to everybody, and I said, someday I'm going to fly on that. And they started laughing, like, you'll never get selected as an astronaut. But it became a quest. For seven years, I tried, got turned down, tried, got turned down. And finally, by perseverance, by continuing to try and working hard and publishing all my research, I got selected. So when I got when I got pictures back from my crystals, you see the droplet? There it is. And the little white dots that you see are crystals floating in the drop. On Earth, those crystals would be sunk to the bottom, all stuck together. And then we can't use them. But in space, wherever this crystal starts to grow, it stays right there. Again, because there's no gravity. And so it was the perfect way to grow crystals. And so NASA started a huge program growing protein crystals in space. Next slide. So I finally got selected. And I know you're not going to believe me, but way over on the right, that's me when I weighed 140 pounds and had black hair. And so that was back in 1992 when they took that photograph. There were two women and five men on my flight. Next slide. So what I had to learn first in the first year is all the science, because you just don't do your own experiment. I had to do 31 different experiments in combustion, all kinds of combustion experiments, fluid dynamics. How do fluids flow without gravity? Three different types of crystal growth. So I did protein crystal growth, but I had to learn how to grow zeolite crystals. Zeolites are what we use as one of the last ways to purify gasoline. And then finally, semiconductor crystals, like in the computer and the cameras here in the room. Um, so we grew those in big ampules where we heated metal to very high temperatures. Um, because I was an eye doctor, NASA said, and I am the only eye doctor ever to fly in space, NASA said, let's let them give eye exams. And so they had all the equipment so I could give full eye exams. And I'll never forget, the first time I looked in the back of the eye, I dilated four, the eyes of four crew. And I looked in the back. Everybody had what's called petite hemorrhages, blood leaking from their capillaries. Because when you go to space, your fluid shifts upward, puts more pressure up here. And it made the little blood vessels in your eye, in the back of your eye, start to leak. Can you believe that? So it was very amazing. Uh, but anyway, I also did experiments for kindergarten students. We had an ant farm. It's kind of funny because the ninth day I was supposed to take it out and film how the ants had made homes in there. And it was a big kind of glass thing that you could see into the dirt and where the ants were. Well, all the ants had died. I think we should have put helmets on them on launch or something. I don't know. But anyway, anyway, um, uh, so to be selected as an astronaut, I want to tell you how that goes. First, I have to be healthy. So I took a three day physical. And then let's go to the next slide. There's a lot of training we go through. So we have to learn all about the mainframe of the computers, how the, how the space shuttle works. Um, we have to learn the orbital mechanics, how we're going to go around the Earth. We had to um, learn how to repel on a rope down the top of the space shuttle. Um, we had to take all kinds of medicine. So if someone does get sick in space, they know you can tolerate that medicine. Um, and we had to learn all about fire safety. So I got to put out fires that were bigger than the size of this room. And we have special equipment to put it out depending on the type of fire. That was a lot of fun doing that. Next slide. Quiet. So we also, let's say we're at the top of the space shuttle on Earth ready to get in it. Well, we're 160 feet up. And let's say a fire breaks out. We go down a zip line. You all know what that is. And we hit the ground. And it was kind of neat when we hit the ground. What if there's something explodes? We have to be protected, right? So we actually get in a U.S. tank, a real tank, and I got to drive a tank away. Everyone gets a nickname when they fly in space. You know what they called me? Which way? Because I have no sense of direction. But when I got in that tank, the commander was with me, and I said, where can I drive it? He said, which way? Anywhere you want. You're in a tank. And I said, really? 
So there were a bunch of trees off in the distance, and I drove the tank right over the trees. It just knocks them right down. We had a lot of fun doing that. Next slide. So we also get in a centrifuge, and it spins you around. So the shuttle, when we take off, you get a little bit over three, three and a half Gs or so. So first they make you do that. Then they say, you want to see how tough you are. And I'm very competitive, I guess, from sports. And so they go faster and faster. And I actually got up to 8.3 Gs. At that point, you're squished into your seat, and it squished all the blood out of my eye. And so everything was black. I couldn't see. And when I can't take it anymore, I was supposed to push this little button. And I didn't want to push it, but they saw I was starting to pass out. So they stopped it. But I was second on my crew, so I was pretty proud of myself until later I became chief scientist for the International Space Station at NASA headquarters. And at that time, John Glenn, one of the first astronauts, was a senator. I went to dinner with John, and I told him what I did. And I said, John, what did you do? Well, he's very humble. He didn't want to hurt my feelings. But he said, well, Larry, actually, he set the record for NASA, 16 Gs for 40 seconds. So I must be the wrong stuff and he's the right stuff. <laughs> Next slide. So this is me in training. And one of the things we have to do is we, we, get, we parasail up to 500 feet and then they, they, we hit these clips and it releases us. And then we parachute into the ocean. And that's me in a little raft that's in my backpack. And then once you hit the water, they make you stay in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You can't see land. You can't see any other crew. You're all by yourself. And I had to stay out there. I was out there about 14 hours. Now, in my backpack, I have some water, but no food. But NASA's pretty nice. If you want, you do have an expandable fishing pole. So you can try to catch a fish. But of course, you can't build a fire in that little rubber raft. So if you catch something, you're going to have to eat, you know, eat it raw, sushi, right? So I just starved for 14 hours. And then I vectored uh, a plane to come see me, find me. And then once they do, a helicopter comes, lowers this big sinker. You grab on it, and it pulls you up into the helicopter. And I had my visor open, so the helicopter was only about 15 feet over the water. It was like a hurricane. The water went into my helmet, up my nose. I liked it. I liked doing that stuff. But it was a lot of fun. Next slide. So I also fly on these little T-38 jets there. And then that's the big jet that there's no seats in it. It's a big passenger jet. It goes up to 40,000 feet and then it just falls. Now, since it's falling at the rate that gravity pulls you inside the jet, there's no gravity. It's just like if, you know, if I took out my phone and we put an ant in there and I drop it, that ant is floating while it's dropping at the rate that gravity pulls you. So you have 40 seconds in that jet to float around, and then it has to pull out before it hits the ocean. So now everybody is pulling two and a half times your body weight. You're stuck to the floor, and they just keep doing one parabola after another over the Atlantic Ocean. You don't want to eat any food when you get on that. The name of the jet is the Vomit Comet. And of course, if you barf when we're floating, the barf will float through the plane, and boy, that's a nasty thing to have happen. Next slide. That's me inside the jet, see, floating, wasting taxpayer money. Most of the time, I'm strapped to the side testing hardware. It's a great way to test your hardware without gravity before you build the final one for the space flight. And on the right is my, my launch. And uh, the launch from the time you take off till we got to space, ready? Eight minutes and 43 seconds, we were in orbit. Next slide. Well, when you get up there, that's the state of Florida. That's the way it looked with my naked eye. And you see the light blue at the top? That's our atmosphere. From looking at Earth from space, it looks like we're surrounded by a sheet of paper that we all need to share and breathe. And it really teaches you it's important to protect the environment. Next slide. So show you how dramatic space is. This is a candle on the left burning on Earth. It's pointed because warm air rises because of gravity. Cool air comes from below, so it's getting a lot of oxygen, and that turns it yellow. Well, if you burn a candle in space, there, are, there is no warm air rising because there's no lighter and heavier molecules, so you see it's a blue ball. That's the way it looks in space. So it's amazing difference. Next slide. 
So I told you that, that surface tension it dominates in space. And now I'm going to show you an example. Next slide. This is Don Pettit. You can have a drop of liquid on your finger. It's going to stick to your finger and then you can just suck it off. But when I was in space, how did we drink liquid? Well, I had an orange drink in a bag and you put your straw in this little hole in the middle and you start drinking. Well, when you do, what happens to the rest of the liquid? It's not at the bottom of the bag. It sticks to the wall. So I had to point my straw toward the wall, squeeze the bag and get liquid over where my straw was pointed. Well, Don Pettit and a scientist at another university said, let's take advantage of surface tension and design a space coffee cup. And so the next slide shows you the first design they came up with. So that's the space coffee cup right there. It's, it's wider on the far end. It gets more narrow toward the, 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 this end here. And then as it gets toward his mouth, it gets the walls get closer together. So because of surface tension, it pulls the liquid right up to his mouth where he wants to drink it. Pretty cool. So that doesn't look very attractive as a coffee cup. So then they came up with the next design. You see, it's wider on the far end. It gets more narrow as you go toward the left side here. And then up at the top where you put your lips, there's lots of surface. So the liquid will stick up there. So that's the way they can drink liquid now in space. I wish I had had that when I flew. Next slide. There's the space station that's up there now. It's going around the earth every 90 minutes. Pretty incredible. Next slide. So we're going to eventually go to Mars. It's not going to be easy. To do it, we have to build these habitats. We're going to do it with huge 3D printers, bigger than the top of this ceiling great big erector type 3D printers to build the habitat that we'll live in when we go to Mars. Next slide. And that's how we're gonna go there in the Orion capsule. How would you like to be in that? It's 15 feet wide, so it's not that wide, right? And about 12 and a half feet tall. And we're gonna put four astronauts in there and to go from Earth to Mars will take almost six months. So you all have to live in there together for six months, pretty close quarters. Next one. Okay, just some pretty photographs. That's a portion of Italy over there. And this on the left is the Middle East. I'll never forget how beautiful it was to look at Earth when you're up in space. They should fly a poet or a writer because it's just very emotional. Next slide. Lightning from space is not a streak, it's like a flashbulb. And when we flew over South America, there was a lot of thunderstorm activity and I would watch and I'd see a flash and another one and another one. It was like a chain reaction went over the whole continent of South America. It was just amazing to watch. Next one. So, so we go around the earth every 90 minutes and that means you get a sunrise or a sunset every 45 minutes. It's just amazing to see. Next slide. And on the left here is the end of the Nile River. And, and this is a close up. You can't see it like this with your naked eye, but that's the Suez Canal. And on the right are the Canary Islands, the dark blue areas. And up at the upper right, the brown you see is the northwest coast of Africa. Next slide. So this is a sandstorm coming off the coast of Saudi Arabia. We saw that on the first day. 14 days later, you could still see the trail of it all the way over the Atlantic Ocean, and it was over Cuba. Again, it really teaches you when you hear about an oil spill on one side of the earth, it gets to the other, and we don't always work together to clean up things like that. Next slide. Sleep in little boxes like this. You get inside there, and you can go to sleep. And how do we take a bath? Well, on the space shuttle, we don't have a shower. So Carl, me, he, was, he flew with me. Carl can squirt the, the no-rinse shampoo on his head. You lather up, and you just dry off with a towel. Uh, on Space Station, we actually designed a shower. But can you imagine? They never put it up there. Probably this is why. You get in the shower, you turn the water on, you start soaping up. The water's not going to fall on the floor. There's no gravity, right? So what happens? You pretty soon are surrounded by a bubble of soapy water over your whole body. 
Now you could be like a dog and maybe shake and it would fly off and stick to the wall. But the way you would dry off with the shower they designed is with a vacuum cleaner. You have to suck it off your body. Next slide. So, so the food comes in trays like this, that's chicken soup. And you wonder why doesn't the liquid come over the edge? Because it's a pinning edge. That means it's a sharp 90 degree angle. As long as it's not rounded, the liquid will come up to it, but it won't go over as long as you don't shake it. So I would just dip my spoon in, pull it out upside down, doesn't matter. You got a bubble of chicken soup on your spoon and then eat it. Now, uh-oh, what happened? <laughs> So I'll also tell you the other part of that slide right down there is a little can and that's where the butterscotch pudding was. And you just pop the top and then eat your butterscotch. But I forgot what NASA taught me. You have to go slowly in space. And I just very quickly popped the top. And when I did, my butterscotch flew across the shuttle and splattered all over the wall. Not there. <laughs> anyway, let's keep going. Next slide. <laughs> Okay, um, so this one, I can't see it. <laughs> okay, I see it there. So maybe we're gonna let the students just see this one. I think everybody else can see it online. So this is the toilet. How, how, do, you go to, how, do, you, how do you go to bathroom in space? Well, you sit down on there and these, these blue things that are spring loaded, you pull them over your leg. And when you let go, they squeeze you into the seat. And then there's a ball over on the right. You push it forward and it turns a vacuum on right through the commode. That's all I ever say about that. You have to use your imagination for anything else. Next slide. And finally, yeah, that's a hurricane. I don't know if you can see it, but that's a hurricane right there. And yeah, that's a hurricane. And we were supposed to come back and we couldn't because of the hurricane. So we stayed up an extra day. And so I only slept about three hours every night for all 14 days. So I was very tired. I went down into the mid deck to go to the bathroom. The commander was in there and I was just floating, waiting for him. And I was so tired, I finally fell asleep, right? And so in the mid deck, there's a cabin fan that cleans the air and it blew me backwards into the airlock where we keep all the dirty laundry. And two hours later, they said, where's Larry? And so everyone went looking for me. And the next slide, uh, me with my, I don't know if you can see it, sticking out of the airlock and I'm floating sound asleep in there. And then finally, the last slide is just the landing. And I think the hardest part of space shuttle flights when you're up that long is when you come back and you have to get used to gravity once again. The event online has now come Thank you so much, Larry. We loved being here today with you. All right. Thanks very much.